Hey, welcome back. Previous videos, we talked about the composition of a health and safety committee and the duties of a joint occupational health and safety committee. But realistically, on the committee, there's roles and positions that need to be filled as well. What exactly is your job here? Yeah, what exactly do they do around here? In this video, I wanna talk about the typical roles on a joint occupational health and safety committee. Now, before you ask, what does the safety professional do? Just wait a bit. I'm gonna talk about that a little later on in the video. But what I wanna talk about is the typical, most common roles. Now, you're gonna to have to keep in mind that depending on company size, complexity, and of course, jurisdictional requirements, there may be slight differences. What I'm gonna go over is the typical roles on a health and safety committee. Just as an aside, uh, scattered throughout this video, I'm going to have different tips, warnings, and uh, points about the different roles on a committee and of course, committee size and how they play. So I suggest you hang around for the whole entire video because it's pretty important. Uh, you should stick around. All committee members have common duties to the organization, which I've talked about in a previous video. But anyway, let's do a quick review. Refreshers don't hurt. As mentioned in a previous video, the committee is composed of individuals representing a cross-section of the organization from both management and non-management groups. Ideally, these are equal numbers, but uh, imbalances may occur, but these imbalances must always favor the non-management or the workforce groups. The main role of each member is to speak for their stakeholder groups at the committee level and then relay information from the committee back to these groups. From these cooperative elements, come specific positions that are of course made up of both workers and managers and let's address those right now. The very first that you might have heard of is uh, co-chairs or co-chairpersons. This is really a best practice approach. It's also common to have a chair and vice chair or a chair and co-chair but a word of warning here. Warning, warning. Depending on your particular situation it can be perceived as a power imbalance management versus workers, especially if a manager is the chair. So it's important that the committee be portrayed as a collegial entity, meaning it's a group of people that happily and pleasantly work together towards a common goal, in this case, health and safety. So a pro tip here, just make it co-chairs. It works better all around. I've said it many times that health and safety must transcend organizational hierarchy and workplace politics. Failing to do so means you fail at being genuinely concerned for health and safety and the committee might be ill-perceived. Now, the position of co-chairs, they get occupied or filled, if you will, a few different ways. One, they can be elected by the committee. Another case, they can be both appointed by the employer. However, if the workers are represented by a union or a different worker group, then the employer would appoint the management co-chair and the union or work group would appoint the worker co-chair. Another case is volunteers from each group can step forward and occupy that position. Word of warning here though, honestly, you gotta make sure that it's for a term. That should be described in your terms of reference. Yeah, next video. Ideally, both people occupy and perform identical roles. And these roles are, of course, taking turns at, with the typical chair duties prior to and during the committee meetings. Now, these are typically putting out a call for agenda items, preparing the agenda, setting out the final agenda, and of course, a copy of the minutes from the previous meeting. Another task that they'll perform is during the meeting, they'll ensure the progression of the agenda during the meeting, and of course, moderating discussion, calling for votes, and ensuring that there are entries made into the minutes by the recorder. I know, you wanna know what happens if there's no union or no volunteer step forward, well, just be patient. I'm gonna to get to that, trust me. Now, the next position I mentioned it already is a recorder or secretary. Depending on the organizational structure of your company, this role can be performed a few different ways or it gets occupied a few different ways. The organization can provide admin support and that worker may or may not be a voting member of the committee. Another case is members may alternate uh, between meetings or every second meeting recording minutes and this would be they would take the minutes, type them, edit the final minutes, post the minutes wherever required. Some jurisdictions require a physical posting of hard copies in common areas such as lunchrooms. So it's important, check your OHS authority for details. And what I mean by alternating is that uh, if one meeting a manager is doing the co-chair position, then that means someone from the worker group would be taking the minutes and doing the recording. 
Alternately, the next meeting, a worker co-chair would be chairing the meeting and someone from management would be taking the minutes. That's one other possibility. Another method, of course, is to elect someone uh, or if someone steps forward to have them volunteer. Another role is, and it's very similar, and these are alternates. Each role should have an alternate person from the organization, ideally from the committee willing to step in should the person serving that role, such as a co-chair or a recorder, be absent. Co-chairs can easily alternate for each other, so can uh, recorders or secretaries. It all depends on your committee and your organization. But a word of warning here, alternates should be attending the meetings at least occasionally every second meeting. If not, they're not going to have an idea of the committee dynamics and they might not be aware of what's going on within health and safety within the organization. So ideally they should have some vested interest in the committee. Now these are the basic roles of the committee. However, depending on the organization's size, complexity, and of course your employer's desire and motivation to resource the committee, there may be additional roles and these are optional, but they're very good roles. Let's talk about them right now. Of course, uh, there's uh, these are usually non-voting and advisory, but the first one is an HR advisor. This is a representative from the HR section or department that would provide the committee with guidance when things start to transcend safety and into labor relations employee rights, employment law, or even if it's advice on how the health and safety program works within the collective agreement. Always good to have an HR advisor or somebody from the HR group attending meetings where possible. The next one is a policy advisor. Now, policy advisors, depending on the size and complexity of your organization, of course, you might desire someone from the policy committee or department or section or the group that looks after policies for the organization. What they do is they help to ensure that there's a continuous alignment with the health and safety policy. Hopefully it's policy, not policies. And of course, the organization policies to make sure that there's uh, no conflict, that they, everything works in alignment. The other position you might see is a communications advisor. Once again, totally dependent on your organization dynamics. But someone from the communications department is vital because they help to ensure that there's a continuity with safety communications at the corporate level internally, but also externally, especially if you've had safety related incidents that have made the news. The one that you've been waiting for, the health and safety professional. It's important, you have to realize one thing, the health and safety professional should be advisory and should be non-voting if possible. You should be there, if you're the health and safety person, you should be there just for guidance and guidance only. I know, you're likely surprised, but let me tell you why. If you're an active member, and it's not unusual. I've seen it in my experience and I've had other safety professional colleagues of mine tell me the same thing. That if they're becoming an active participant, then what happens is the participation of the other members starts to wane. <laughs> they leave a lot to you. This is not a sustainable model. Instead of problem solving as a committee, as an organic entity, you'll find that the membership might just start relying on you uh, to answer every question, solve every problem. Now, you need to be there by all means, but you need to let them grow and, and work things out themselves. There has to be learning opportunities for the committee. And honestly, you won't always be there. Here's the newsflash. You're gonna get sick. You're gonna be on vacation. There's gonna be lots of cases where you as the safety professional won't be able to be there. So I know you've got the question. So what's the answer? Well, here's the answer. You need to be in an advisory role. Advise the committee on H OHS compliance. Realistically, OHS compliance, but the granular stuff. There should be things that they know. Make sure that you're helping them to interpret that OHS legislation. Guide them in becoming the stewards of the health and safety management system or the health and safety program. They don't have to write it, but they should have an active role in the stewardship of it. I talked about stewardship in our, another video, and of course, there'll be a link in the description. And of course, you're gonna help them to rely on their terms of reference when they hit an impasse or they encounter something out of the ordinary. Yes, terms of reference is gonna be examined in the next video. So I'll just take this moment. If you haven't done so yet, you might wanna subscribe, ding the bell, that way you'll get notified when the next video in this series comes out. What do you do if there's no volunteers, if nobody steps forward? Or if you have positions on the committee that aren't filled yet? You know what, honestly, if you make a request to the employer, this will often help rectify things. And it might even be if you're resurrecting a, a, a committee that's hasn't been active or you're forming a brand new committee, maybe your first 
order of business is going to make a formal request in writing as a recommendation of the employer to assign or work with the union to fill these open positions. I know you've got questions. What do you do if the employer doesn't respond or the employer isn't playing along? There's a lot of moving parts to that and I'm going to address that in a later video. So once again, stay tuned. The next question I'd like to have is, what do you do if you're a small committee or how big do you have to be and what's a small committee and what's a big committee? There's no easy answer for that. Most jurisdictions have a minimum requirement. Often that common number is four. And as far as how big, it doesn't matter how big, but just keep in mind, it's easier to maneuver a sports car than it is a Greyhound bus. Being small enough to be agile, but being big enough where you have adequate representation is key. So once again, if you only have four people, well, that's pretty simple. Two worker chair or two workers, two management, two co-chairs, one of each management and work group and two alternate recorders, one from each group. Fairly simple. And so what do you do if you have that small committee and somebody's absent due to illness or vacation or whatever? Well, you don't ever want to forego meeting. That, and that's what you don't want to do, especially since some jurisdictions have it in the legislation that there's a certain amount of meetings that you have to have in a calendar year. You're going to have to have it written into your terms of reference. We'll talk more about that next video. And you likely have other questions as well. What to do when members are on sick leave or leave the organization or how do you fill certain positions? What's the case? These are all excellent questions and they're going to be covered by your terms of reference, but I don't want to beleaguer this and run on too long. So stay tuned for the next video. In fact, I'm going to be putting the next video up in this corner. Um, until I get it done though, YouTube's going to stick one that they think is appropriate up here. Up here, you're going to have a playlist on Toolbox Talks. So thank you for hanging out. I want you to do me a favor though. Until we see each other again, and I really hope we do, don't just think about safety, don't just talk about safety, but be an active participant. Be a safety influencer. Provoke safety by doing safety wherever you are. Take care. Bye for now.